Good morning, everyone. My name is Shira Uriarte, and I'm the program manager for member education at the Jewish Funders Network. Thank you so much for joining this important webinar, Funding Health, Wellness, and Disease Prevention. I'm so pleased that we'll be joined by two scholars today, JFN member Dr. Norbert Goldfield and Dr. Kate Lorig. Dr. Goldfield deeply cares about health and healing issues and has been part of a small group of JFN members who want to start a peer network of funders who care about these issues. Many of them are on the call today. He's the founder and executive director of Healing Across the Divides, a 13-year-old organization focusing on peace building throughout health in the, Pal the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Healing Across the Divides accomplishes its objective by seeking to improve health through community-based, locally-driven interventions aimed at marginalized Israelis and Palestinians. He also works as the medical director for Private Healthcare Research Group, developing tools linking payment for healthcare services to improve quality of care outcomes. He's a board-certified internist practicing at the Community Health Center and edits a peer-reviewed medical journal, the Journal of Ambulatory Care Management, and has published more than 50 books and articles. Dr. Kate Lorig is Professor Emerita at Stanford University School of Medicine and is the developer of a number of community-based health promotion disease prevention programs for seniors and others. She also serves as a spiritual care volunteer with the Jewish Stanford Chaplaincy Service. First, we're going to hear from Dr. Lorig, and she will define the terms associated with this field and give an overview of health and wellness as it relates to philanthropy. And then Norbert will pose questions to Kate and we'll end with Q&A from everybody. So I'd like to turn it over to Kate now. Good morning. Could we please have the first slide? And the third slide. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm delighted to be with you all. And since I don't know you, the first part of this slide may be oversimplistic and it may be new information. It's just a little bit of an overview of what the burden is around the world. And I can thank the Centers for Disease Control for, this, for the first part of the slides in this presentation. So it used to be, at least when I was growing up and first doing international work, that uh, hunger and infectious diseases were the major killers in the world today. This is not really true today. Although these data are for the United States, this is pretty true around the world, that non-communicable conditions or chronic conditions such as diabetes, cancer, uh, respiratory diseases actually count, account for two thirds of the world's deaths today. So our big problems have really changed a great deal over the last 50 years. Can we see the next slide, please? Not only that, but these, these diseases are incredibly costly. Um, we know that in the United States, if you're older than about 50, that your average number of chronic conditions is 2.2 chronic conditions. So about 50% of all US adults have chronic conditions. And by the time you get to be 60 years old, probably 70 to 80 percent of, of um, U.S. population has chronic conditions. Um, 93 percent of all Medicare costs go for chronic conditions. So not only are these a burden to individuals, they're a huge burden to society because people live with these conditions for many, many years. The next slide, please. Now, <clears throat> there's a great deal that can be done to prolong the time of health and shorten the time of illness. Uh, Jim Fries called this the compression of morbidity or the compression of chronic illness. Uh, we cannot totally prevent all chronic diseases. I wish we could. Sometimes we kind of may overpromise what we can do, but we can certainly prolong the times of health and shorten the times of illness. However, all of these efforts in health promotion at the present time are only receiving about 3% of the total US health spending. And it's probably about the same 
as that worldwide. So we're not actually putting much money into this whole area of health promotion disease prevention. And by the way, this includes not only preventing the diseases, but helping people live more healthfully with the diseases once they have them. We'll talk about that a little bit later. Next slide, please. And you would think given that, that maybe people in the US government would be more interested in this whole area. In fact, um, if you look at the budget, which we don't have um, for the coming year, the proposed budget is actually cutting the amount of money that is going to this field. It is not expanding it. So we have, in sum, a problem, an expensive problem, an expensive problem that's not getting much attention and seems to be get, going to be getting less attention than we have now. Can we continue, please? So when we talk about chronic diseases, we actually talk about, and we talk about prevention, we actually talk about three areas. We talk about preventing the disease. Uh, and that's why we eat healthily and we get enough sleep and we do exercise. We talk about early detection, mammograms, colonoscopies, these sorts of things, and mitigation. Mitigation has to do with helping people live better, live fuller lives when they do have chronic illnesses, and optimizing the quality of life and reducing the demands on the healthcare system. Uh, another way of talking about these in public health terms is primary preventing, secondary detecting, and tertiary mitigating prevention. Primary, secondary, and tertiary prevention. You'll sometimes hear these terms. And next, please. Um, so when we're talking about these, these terms, one of the things that we want is we want cost-effective programs. And cost-effective programs is going to be including the ones I'm going to talk about in a minute, uh, the, uh, the uh, diabetes prevention program. Um, these programs address key problems such as heart disease, diabetes, etc. They help develop lifestyle interventions over periods ranging from weeks and months. And they usually have standardized protocols that are then custom tailored to specific communities. We have a number of these programs. We have lots of these programs. Um, some of them uh, we actually know are effective. Some of them we just think are effective. And next, please. I'm going to talk about one of those programs today, the Chronic Disease Self-Management Program. These pictures are pictures of participants all over the world, uh, the Caribbean, Canada, India, China, the United States. Um, you can, and we could add many more countries, but I didn't want to show you pictures all day. And let's talk a little bit about this program. The next slide, please. So why should we care about chronic disease self-management? We've already said that a huge number of people around the world have chronic diseases. They're living with these diseases day in and day out. And what these people do is they only spend about 1% or even less than 1% of their time within the healthcare system. The rest of their time, they're walking around in the community, living their daily lives. And how they live their daily lives during this time greatly affects their quality of life and also their use of the healthcare system. Unfortunately, until very recently, we've had very little in the way of formalized programs to help people learn with chronic diseases how to live their lives on a day to day basis. The next slide, please. So the program that we developed at Stanford years ago and which is still being used around the world, the Chronic Disease Self-Management Program, is it's small groups of 10 to 16 people. There are people with many different diseases and comorbidities in the same group. And why can you do that? You can do that because about 80% of the things that people need to do to manage chronic illnesses are the same across illnesses. 
it also allows people that would never get any chronic disease self-management to get these programs. I have one of the Jewish hereditary diseases. I have Gaucher's disease. There are less than 2,000 of us. I can promise you that nobody is going to ever put together a program in chronic disease self-management for Gaucher's disease. And by putting people like me or people with cystic fibrosis or people with silk cell disease or people with colitis or pe with people with diabetes and heart disease, it means that we can reach all people with chronic illnesses. Plus which, most of us have more than one chronic illness. We have two or three. And this means that we don't have to go to a heart disease prevention, a heart disease class one week and a lung class the next week and a diabetes class the next week. We can basically get the basic content all together in one class. The courses are two and a half hours a week for six weeks, and they're facilitated by peers. What do I mean by peers? I mean people from their own communities. So if I'm in an African-American community, the peers are probably going to be African-American. If I'm at the Jewish Community Center, the <coughs> peers are probably going to be older Jews. If I'm at the Stanford campus, they're quite probably going to be, the facilitators are probably going to be uh, retired faculty and staff from Stanford. That's what I mean by peers. Next slide, please. What do we teach? We teach managing symptoms because what people care about most are symptoms, pain, fatigue, depression, shortness of breath, disability, not being able to do the things we want to do. We teach exercise and we help people tailor that exercise to their own conditions. So exercise for some people may be a minute, an hour while you're awake, and for other people it may be walking 10 minutes twice a day, and for other people it may be uh, walking a mile or two a day. We teach a variety of relaxation techniques. We teach basic healthy eating, communication skills, communication with family and friends, communication with the healthcare system, and communication with healthcare professionals. And those, by the way, are different sorts of things and different skills. We talk about medication management. Not medications, because we certainly couldn't talk about the medications of all the people that come to our programs. But we do talk about how do you manage your medications? How do you remember to take them? What is it that medications can do? Many people think that medications make you better. Well, many medications do make you better. But in chronic disease, many medications also help you get worse more slowly. That's a new concept to many people. And finally, we teach three very basic skills to self-management. Problem solving, how do you solve problems? We teach a very formalized pro way to do this. Action planning, how do you make a commitment each week and follow through on it? And finally, decision making. All of us have many decisions. And what decision making does is it helps us make better and stronger decisions. So these are the things that are taught over six weeks. And now let's see the next slide, please. I'm going to show you one study. There are probably at this point more than 40 studies about this program. This was a study that was done about four or five years ago in 22 sites all across the United States. Um, the training of all the leaders and the program delivery was done at all the sites. The sites went all the way from Maine to Southern California to uh, Illinois, Denver, Ohio, New Jersey, Florida, Texas. We had more than 1,000 participants. 40% of those uh, in this study were underserved minority populations. And we were focusing on the on outcomes being in the areas of the triple aims of health care. Triple aims are better care for people, better outcomes, and lower costs. And the next slide, please. At one year, what did we see? We saw that people had less depression. Depression is, by the way, one of the most common symptoms across chronic illnesses. We know that about 30% of people 
with any chronic illness are actually clinically depressed. They may not know they're clinically depressed, but when we give them standardized tests, we can see this. And depression drives a great deal of the angst and the problems of chronic disease. People had less pain. They were doing more exercise. They were better. They were better adhering to their medications. They were taking them on time as they were supposed to. They had fewer unhealthy mental health days and fewer unhealthy physical days. They had less healthcare utilization. And the savings per individual by taking this program was about three hundred and fifty dollars per person. I might mention that we now have four or five cost effectiveness studies, <clears throat> and all of these studies show that the savings from less utilization is around this same figure, around $350 per person. And the next slide, please. So, in ending, uh, because I really wanted to have lots and lots of time for you to ask questions. Um, here's some questions um, that um, I thought as a funder. I have to admit, I've never been a funder, but I've certainly sat on review committees. Uh, the questions that you might ask as people come to you or approach you for programs. Number one, is there a need? Almost always there's a need. But then the next question is, is this a local need? And if it is, and you want to fund locally, that's terrific. Maybe you don't have to do anything more than locally. Or is this a broader need, and does whatever you're funding have to do, uh, have effects on a broader <coughs> audience? Excuse me, I have a cold today. Number two is the intervention evidence-based. And this is becoming more and more important, not only here, but I'm doing work with the World Health Organization, and it's also very important for them. An evidence-based program means that the program has been published somewhere usually, and it was usually conducted a randomized trial. It was published in a peer-reviewed journal, usually by a randomized trial, usually more than one uh, publication. Second, are there tools for dissemination? We have many, many uh, wonderful health promotion disease prevention programs. Uh, they seem to be really, really effective. But in fact, uh, nobody can do them except the people that put them together. There's no manuals. There's no way of doing this. There's no training. So for, pro for intervention to be evidence-based, there must be tools for, an in for dissemination. These include training manuals, administrative manuals, and fidelity manuals. Are there standards by which you can judge? Is this program being done the way it was originally intended, or is it not? I should mention that in the United States, there is the Evidence-Based Leadership Council, and this council has been working very hard to see that evidence-based programs get to adults and especially senior citizens. If you want to know more about it, just look up Evidence-Based Leadership Council on the web. And by the way, you can also find a program map there, and you will find um, programs that are evidence-based in your geographic area. And the final question that I'd probably ask as a funder is, are these efforts being coordinated with other efforts? Or are they a standalone effort that um, doesn't impact other organizations, other systems? I think as we're doing this more and more, we're working more and more to see that there are systems and coordinated efforts uh, across the world, across the uh, country. As I said, I'm working both with WHO now and with a number of organizations in the United States to set up networks of these programs to make them available as widely as possible. I think that I have probably reached the end of my slides, unless I'm wrong. Is that correct? Yes. So I think we're at a point that uh, I think Norbert might have some questions for me, and then you can be thinking of questions you have for me, and we'll have plenty of time to do both. Kate, I want to thank you very much. It's really a pleasure, and in fact, it's an honor uh, to uh, to be part of this uh, effort that JFN is leading. Um, I would just make a 
two or three very brief introductory comments, uh, uh, then uh, ask a couple questions and hopefully that'll stimulate a whole bunch of other questions. Uh, as I've indicated uh, to my colleagues at JFN and to Kate, uh, everything that we do at Healing Across the Divides is informed by the fact that I'm Jewish and that's my primary uh, identity. <clears throat> um, we fund 10 different initiatives in both Israel and the West Bank. In fact, we have implemented Kate Lorg's work, uh, the Chronic Disease Self-Management Program, uh, primarily because it's uh, not just evidence-based, which is absolutely critical for people like myself, but in addition, uh, there's a manual, been translated and validated in Arabic, uh, and so there's a potential uh, for it to be carried forward. And over a thousand individuals with diabetes osteoarthritis and hypertension, you know, are participating in this in a variety of different uh, villages between Ramallah and uh, Nablus. We're doing other interventions, uh, working with Israeli community-based groups on uh, uh, one that's in, uh, uh, that's starting right now in Carmiel, and uh, that's working uh, with uh, Israeli uh, marginalized Jews, and another one uh, in Yerucham, uh, in the Southern Negev, that uh, is working uh, on issues pertaining to healthy eating. So I think the points, you know, that last slide by, uh, uh, by Kate really highlights the importance of, uh, of evidence base, uh, that there's, you know, a possibility of replicability because as Kate said, there's many different ways uh, and many different tools that have been developed that are completely reliant on the, uh, on the developer. So with that as background, uh, I'd like to just start off with a couple questions. And again, like I said, uh, hopefully there'll be lots of other questions. We have plenty of time for questions. Um, so why don't we start out, Kate, uh, considering that the JFN is very well established in the United States, from your perspective, what is the current climate in the United States around the integration of lifestyle-based interventions as a means of dealing with chronic conditions such as multiple sclerosis and other conditions that are chronic? I think the climate is very good. <clears throat> good. I think that we have a network of community organizations that are working together, um, that has grown over the last many years. We don't have time to really talk about it all now, but this initiative was actually started by Atlantic Philanthropy about 10 years ago. So philanthropy has had a very, very important role in this. Uh, while I say that the climate is good and the need is there, the major problem today is funding. As I say, the, the federal funding is diminishing. The entire federal budget for community-based chronic disease programs for older people is $12 million. Not much money for an entire nation. So it means that if these programs are to exist, because even if they're run by volunteers, at some level they need staff, they need coordination, they need oversight. Um, it means that funding is going to have to come from other places. There's a, and right now we have a hodgepodge of funding nationally, although networks are beginning to be formed. So climate is good, funding scene, not so good. Thank you. Uh, my next question uh, is, uh, and then I'll make a brief comment before you respond, uh, is as follows. To what extent have different stakeholders uh, this question applies throughout the world and uh, certainly uh, uh, includes uh, uh, Israeli participants, not just American participants, and, uh, and you, anybody from the UK, et cetera. Uh, to what extent have different stakeholders, health professionals, policymakers, insurance companies, medical researchers, et cetera, mainstream lifestyle-based interventions for individuals with either chronic conditions or people who are well? And before you answer the question, I just want to comment from a Healing Across the Divides perspective that our grants are three-year grants. We presume that we as, a, as a, a funder, that we're going to take a risk on issues that may not be completely well established. But by the second year of the third year uh, of the three-year grant, 
we demand and ask and require that the community-based group uh, develop a plan by which they start involving stakeholders. Uh, so the, again, my question is to what extent, uh, Kate, have different stakeholders mainstreamed these interventions? Um, it's very interesting because it seems to change over time and stakeholders seem to come and go and then come again. Uh, today, uh, we have at least two countries with national programs, Ireland and Denmark. We have the English National Health Service, which was a stakeholder, for whatever reason decided to, to, to um, spin off its programs to a not-for-profit company, and strangely enough is looking at becoming a stakeholder again now. So it's, it's a little unclear what's happening in England. Uh, actually, it's clearer, but I won't go into the details. Um, the World Health Organization, especially for Latin America, has been a major stakeholder uh, with programs growing in many countries in Latin America at this point. In this country, um, the National Council on Aging has been a technical resource center for many years and kind of the go-to point, not so much for funding, but for knowledge about these pro about programs. But as I say, the stakeholders change. Um, there are indeed some third-party payers, some insurers. I know Tufts Health's plan in your state, Norbert, has been involved with this and some others. But, but, but they come and go. And we, for the first time, will have a survey of stakeholders, which was just done by the um, National Association of the Area Agencies on Aging. I've not seen that yet, but we'll have a better idea of exactly who the stakeholders are in this country once that is published. Thank you. Um, and another way of asking for uh, questions is I've been to several <clears throat> of the uh, JFN annual meetings. Uh, I've co-chaired the healthcare track at the first uh, uh, effort, uh, uh, the first JFN annual meeting I was in Israel. And I've never met, to my knowledge, any JFN member who was shy. So I would like to uh, encourage you all to start uh, either writing questions or emailing them to Shira. I don't see any questions just yet, but I'm now gonna go to my third question. Uh, <clears throat> uh, and then uh, uh, after Kate's answer, I might um, make a comment. How can funders move the needle locally and or globally around the adoption of different lifestyle practices pertaining to exercise, diet, mindfulness, some of the issues that Kate brought up as a way to promote their health and wellness? they can do a couple of different things. I think the first thing I would do is a community scan or a national scan and see what's, what, what's out there already and what's of interest to you. I'm not saying that the definitive programs are there already, but I see all too often funders creating kind of wonderful new initiatives that go on for a couple of years and then go away because they really had no infrastructure or movement into the mainstream. And there's all kinds of places out there where funders could make a real difference by taking a small piece of something and saying, this is what we want to do, or we want to move this program to this uh, population. Uh, you certainly did that. Um, there was no way that anybody else in the world that I know of at this time could have seen that the program would have moved to Palestine, that our program would have moved to Palestine, and hopefully very soon to Israel. Actually, it is in Israel. I shouldn't say that. There's a very small, very small nexus of the program in Israel at this point. So it's, it's taking that scan, and I think that's the way they can most be involved. Um, and then they mindfully deciding where is it that fits our Jewish values, our foundation values to be involved, whether it's locally, globally, or somewhere in between. 
So that's, uh, that's actually interesting. So that's why I'm glad I came after you because <clears throat> in many ways, uh, that was exactly the comment that I was going to say. Uh, but just to put it differently within an Israeli context, um, uh, we're not interested uh, in, um, in programs. And I'll give the example of either translation services for Ethiopian Jews uh, or music therapy, uh, where the evidence is, is clear one way or another. So uh, uh, we want to take a risk uh, uh, where the evidence is, uh, is clear, uh, but there may be a reluctance for any number of reasons uh, for, for something to, uh, for an effort uh, such as chronic disease self-management or an effort to decrease childhood accidents at home that we're, uh, uh, that we're beginning with. Um, so, so I think the issue of looking at the evidence is very important. Uh, the issue of looking at the scan uh, is absolutely critical. And if there's simply no acceptance of something that's evidence-based, I think that uh, there has to be some serious questioning as to, you know, you know what, what is our role? And so that's part of uh, the way we, as a funder, uh, look at these issues to try to make an assessment. Is there a possibility? That this might work, uh, and if it if it uh, can work locally, uh, then is there a chance? And that's what we do in the second year of the third year grant, to uh, to try to encourage stakeholders. And several of our efforts have been taken over nationally, either by the uh, private health insurance and or the government. Uh, and so that's that's exactly right, as far as I'm concerned, as to how to look at the uh, needle locally is uh, is really doing a community scan of of what's available. I have one more question, and then I'm hoping that there'll be uh, uh, questions that we can turn to. Uh, and this is, uh, on some level, I want to thank the people at JFN, uh, my colleagues Shira and Samantha and others at JFN for, uh, for putting forward uh, the basis of this question, because even though uh, it may seem like a strange question, it's absolutely a critical question as far as I'm concerned. And the question is as follows. Even though it may be counterintuitive, do pharmaceutical device manufacturers and other companies whose earnings derive from healthcare encounters have a role in transforming the thinking around the use of lifestyle-based interventions? If yes, how can it be advanced? If no, how can they still be engaged? You probably asked the right person because uh, this, this is kind of a double-edged sword. Uh, Today in the United States, probably the organizations with the most money for health promotion, disease prevention are pharmaceutical companies. Uh, the use of that money is almost always tied to a product or a drug or advertising of some sort. Uh, many healthcare organizations are more and more wary of accepting this money. Having said that, one of the things that's happening in the United States is that many healthcare organizations are now forming their own foundations, and or maybe they've always had them, I'm not sure. These foundations um, have been very helpful in giving monies um, to determine large questions, um, I'm thinking specifically of a very large diabetes initiative uh, that was run around the world by one of the, by one of the pharmaceutical foundations. Uh, we recently have completed a study with another pharmaceutical foundation that included ourselves, a major insurer, and the pharmaceutical uh, organization and the National Council on Aging. So that I think that there really is a place for pharmaceutical, and, and I'm, I'm talking about pharmaceutical, but this is also true of healthcare organizations, most of the major uh, third party insurers, Aetna, Kaiser, et cetera, have their own foundations. So I think there's definitely a role. That role has never been, as far as I can see, um, consolidated around a singular effort or several efforts. It's always been kind of what this foundation wants to do today or that uh, 
but I think that there's real potential there. And I've not seen links between uh, pharmaceutical or other uh, industry foundations and philanthropy. But again, I think there's a role for that to happen. So as somebody who works in the private sector, you know, I would agree uh, wholeheartedly, uh, but with uh, the caveat as you've, uh, as you've uh, outlined, the reality is, is that uh, the private sector, a uh, pharmaceutical company or, or whatever uh, device manufacturer, you know, expects something in return. Uh, and I think as long as there's transparency, uh, then uh, uh, it, uh, you know, the, uh, it can go forward. In a, in a positive way. The reality is, uh, I mean, just to make it simple, uh, uh, those type of entities are the ones that have the funds. You know, the uh, prevention organizations, you know, have, have you, as you very uh, well outlined at the very beginning of this conversation, don't have the funds. Um, still hoping for some questions. Uh, there's a number, there's quite a few participants uh, that are signed on, but we're hoping, I'm hoping for some questions. I guess um, I have my own thoughts about this, uh, Kate. Do you have any sense, uh, Kate, in particular with respect to insurance companies? Uh, the reality is, you know, chronic disease self-management of, of any stripe is very hard uh, uh, to, uh, to engage with insurance companies. And similarly, as somebody, as was uh, kindly stated by Shira at the be very beginning of this, that uh, I'm a clinician, I'm an internist, I see patients two days a week. Uh, uh, you know, I'm, I'm just, uh, I'm also uh, in many ways baffled uh, by the reluctance, and it's, it's definitely present in my practice uh, on the part of medical professionals um, to uh, chronic disease self-management of, of any sort. So I'm just wondering if we could just sort of focus on what you think uh, might be uh, some approaches that might be worthwhile, uh, uh, you know, particularly with respect to insurance companies or Kupoda in Israel or the National Health Service and, and the medical profession in general. Before I do that, I just want to tell people, whoops, how to... Um, how to ask questions. If you go to the very bottom of your screen, there's a black bar. If you kind of scroll along it, you'll see a thing called chat. If you click on it, then you'll see a chat box and you'll be able to type a message there so that we'll get it. I'm not sure that we actually talked about how it was that you asked questions, but that's how you do it. Find, find the chat box at the bottom of your screen, write in something, and uh, but we're here to answer them. So let's talk about why health professions and insurers and, and managing chronic illness or health promotion in general. Quite frankly, health professionals do not have the time to do self-management. We have 14 and a half hours to teach something. A practitioner has maybe, if they're lucky, 15 minutes with a patient. If it's a brand new patient, maybe 40 minutes. They're seeing so many people in a day that other than give maybe one single message, it's very, very difficult for them to do much in the whole area of health promotion disease prevention. And I think for us to feel that this is a burden that should be on the health professionals is an unfair burden to put on them. Secondly, um, they're probably not well educated to do this. Behavioral science is a different science than medical science. Uh, most physicians don't have much behavioral science or health behavior science in their backgrounds. And that's true, by the way, of nurses and physical therapists and everyone else. So while we talk about this being the duty of everyone, in fact, no one does it within the health professions very well. And so if we're going to really have this as a keystone of care, we're going to have to build a system for doing it. <coughs> I happen to feel the community agencies, and I've never found a community that doesn't have community agencies, are in a very good position to do this. Why is that? Because people live in communities. They don't live in healthcare systems. 
and they're much more comfortable going to their local library, their local bank, their local church, their local synagogue to take a program than they are to go to a health facility, which is not usually terribly patient friendly. So um, I think the role of the health professions are to set up a referral system, an encouragement system. We're seeing a number of these happening in your own state in Massachusetts right now. It's probably the most advanced state maybe in the country, if not the world, as far as getting people into programs and referral systems. Uh, the state of Massachusetts can now guarantee a program to anyone in the state within about three or four weeks, usually within a couple of weeks of referral. And we're working on that in different states. And it's a, it's a, it's a systems problem between healthcare systems and community organizations. Um, insurers have been slow to fund these programs and they've been slow to fund it because basically insurers fund based on what employers want. And with a few exceptions, employers don't even know about the programs and so they don't know enough to even ask for them as part of their insurance package. Again, we have an example of a difference here with Unite Here, one of the unions in this country that serves hotel workers, service workers. And Unite Here actually went to their insurers and say, if you want our insurance, because Unite Here insures its own workers as a union, you'll do these programs. And so Unite Here has been doing these programs um, in union halls in Los Angeles and in other areas. So um, we do have some examples of that. But um, <clears throat> as I say, but uh, insurance companies per se have been a little hesitant to do these, uh, mainly because they don't get the benefit. <clears throat> There's a huge amount of churn, people change their insurance companies all the time. And so if they fund somebody to go and take a program, and they take a program and they utilize less. By the time they're utilizing less, they're probably insured by somebody else. Um, hopefully that will change. I think there's some discussion about changes, but um, has not happened um, yet. Two brief comments on that. Uh, the, uh, first of all, for my Israeli colleagues who may be on the phone, I like the idea very much of uh, the uh, community agencies I'm sure all my Israeli colleagues are familiar with uh, the Mat Nassim, uh, and we actually funded an effort uh, to increase uh, mammography rates among Orthodox Jewish uh, women using community health, Orthodox Jewish uh, community health workers, or women, uh, but uh, within a Mat Nassim framework. So I think community agencies uh, are, are, are absolutely uh, very helpful. Uh, I myself am a um, uh, as, uh, as I indicated, I've helped in implement uh, some of Kate's work also, uh, and I actually do it uh, locally for fun in Massachusetts where I live, uh, and I became a master trainer. Uh, but again, the community agency idea is actually a, a, very, a very good idea. Um, the, with respect to the insurance companies, I think, um, uh, uh, the, uh, I think that that's an important issue. Uh, I do believe that employers have to push it. And in the absence of employers, and I guess this is my last comment before I go to the first question, uh, my last comment uh, is that I have to believe and I have to hope because that's who I am uh, both as a Jew and as a, as a, a health professional is that uh, people can make a difference uh, and co individual consumers uh, can make a difference. And I think uh, there's a greater demand on the part of consumers for this uh, for this type of work, uh, that uh, uh, that uh, those of you who are on the call are are interested in. So within that framework, let me ask the first question here uh, to you, Kate. Considering chronic disease as a global problem, can you please elaborate on the position of the NA, uh, the National Health Service in the UK that you mentioned previously? Sure, I'd be happy to. I wish I knew what it was. Um, but I can tell you a little bit of history. The National Health Service for a number of years 
ran the program, ran our programs internal to the National Health Service. And they reached a fairly large number of people. There are a number of studies that have been done, a randomized trial, a cost-effectiveness study, an online study, um, and I can supply you with any of these. About 10 years ago now or so, the National Health Service spun off those programs to a, um, oh, I, I think they're called a special interest company, but I'm not sure that's the exact right name. Um, and that company, and, and also gave the company money to run the programs. I think that company actually still exists. I'm not sure about that. But in effect, after a few years, they stopped giving the programs. The programs continued. And today there's an organization, and I'd be happy to put you in touch with it. It's a fine organization called Talking Health in England. Talking Health is in the business of contracting or helping to contract with local trusts to offer the programs because right now a lot of the a lot of the money in England is flowing through local government organizations, not through the through the federal organizations. So it goes from the federal to the local and then contracting out for these services. And I am certainly not an expert on England but I am very happy to put you in touch with the people that are, they're very good people. I also know that there's a slightly different scheme where the government is more involved in Wales. And I was actually, for, those of you, for those of you that want to get a hold of me, it's very easy. I'm just Lorig, L-O-R-I-G, at Stanford, as in the university, dot edu. We'll definitely be sending all that information out uh, for sure to all, all, uh, all the participants. Actually, I was in England uh, uh, last week and uh, I met with a, a colleague and I just wanna echo uh, one point that you said with respect to training and education. I was with a colleague who's the chairman of community medicine in one of the major uh, universities in England. And again, the, the point that you state, uh, Kate, is absolutely true. The issue in part is the issue of uh, lack of training uh, and uh, what I'm, again, hopeful is that the uh, uh, um, uh, consumer push that can be facilitated uh, by foundations, uh, and uh, that's certainly part of uh, our role at Healing Across the Divides is to try to encourage, and that's why we fund community-based groups in, in part, uh, is to uh, encourage that, uh, that consumer interest. The other thing that I want to highlight is that I, I do believe that there have to be financial incentives uh, for this type of effort. Uh, and the last thing we wanna do is have financial disincentives, you know, by charging money for these type of efforts. Uh, and, uh, 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 and so I think that it's absolutely important that financial incentives go both ways, that we should have financial incentives, frankly, that reward uh, health professionals uh, and I see there's another question, and I'll go to it in a second, that reward health professionals to, em to emphasizing uh, um, uh, this type of uh, chronic disease self-management. It doesn't have to be done by health professionals. You know, we work in large groups. You know, I, I work in a large medical group, which has a lot of uh, health professionals. But there's a, a colleague uh, who has a question, uh, uh, and... Uh, and I'm hoping that he or she will enunciate it, to state it. Yes, uh, hi, hi Norbert and Kate. Thank you so much. This is Shira at JFN. This has been really a, a, a fabulous conversation so far. Um, my question is, what can we tell funders that aren't yet engaged in this universe? What can we tell them so they become engaged. How do we convey to them that this is really a universal need and um, now is the moment to get to get involved? Okay. Uh, I'm trying to think about how, I, I think that you can show people the statistics like I showed you this morning. I think the other way to do this is to say, and I do this very often in a room full of people, how many people in this room 
have a chronic condition or know somebody with a chronic condition? Every hand goes up. How many people does this chronic condition impact their quality of life or you know somebody? Every hand goes up. This is kind of a secret. I walk through life. And if you saw me and you can't see me this morning because I don't have a camera on my computer, but it, I look pretty normal. You know, there's nothing terribly one way or another about me. I but in attest. fact, I was born. What? I can but attest. In fact, that. Yeah, <laughs> but in fact, I was born with a chronic disease and I require 12 hours of sleep a day. And I always have. This really compromises my, my life. When I travel, the first thing I tell people is, I will do anything you want between about 8.30 in the morning and 8.30 at night. I do not do anything after 8.30 at night, which is really very difficult because a lot, in a lot of countries, socializing takes place at that time. And if you really want me to do something after 8.30 at night, then you have to see that I don't do anything until 10 or 11 the next day because I have to manage my life if I'm going to function. And most people with chronic illness, in one way or another, have to do something similar. And it's not something you can see. Sometimes, sometimes it's the non-hidden chronic illnesses that we, you know, we see people with multiple sclerosis, we see people in wheelchairs, we see people that are blind but we don't see the day-to-day -day struggle and symptoms that most people have. And I think the way you interest people in them is you make it personal because it's very hard to make something global until it's personal. I would agree with that. And I would just say that the stories really are uh, uh, a thousand words because at the end of the day, uh, the reality is this type of work is not one where you get to put your name, uh, uh, you know, uh, on a building. This is the type of work that occurs in people's homes and community centers, you know, on the street. Uh, but I think the stories, the absolutely dramatic stories of people uh, doing much better either with a chronic illness or as is, you know, tomorrow I'll be with patients all day, I work with any number of my patients to try to prevent the diabetes from happening where they're at their pre-diabetic stage. Now, that doesn't get any uh, kudos, I can tell you right now, but believe me, if we can prevent the diabetes from happening. If we can prevent the complications of diabetes from happening of any of the other chronic illnesses. Uh, that not only makes a dramatic difference in the lives of these individuals, but just as importantly, is it really saves money. And these days with uh, the dramatic explosion in healthcare costs, which in part are driven by the wonderful good things that, you know, that pharmaceutical companies are coming up with, we need to try to be aware of this. So that's how I look at it. Thanks for the question. It's a very good question. Other questions? There's nothing stated that we have to uh, uh, do this till uh, 12 50, uh, or 11.59. <laughs> no, absolutely not. No, if there aren't any other questions, we can certainly wrap up a little bit early. Um, please, you know, I will circulate uh, Norbert's information, Kate's information to everybody who participated in the call this morning. I'm sure they would, just like Kate said, be willing to help in any way they can. Thank you so much to both of you. Uh, there's, there's actually one question that just came in. Oh, okay, great. <laughs> um, and, and this is a great question to end on, actually. So I appreciate this question. Um, uh, uh, in your experience, how many people, both funders and health professionals, are interested in this space? So why don't you go, Kate, and then I'll uh, take a whack at it. Okay. Well, we know, let's, let's talk about people with chronic illness first. One of the things we know from a recent study that is at any one point in time, 25% of Medicare participants are interested. Now that doesn't mean over the entire lifetime because it may be 50 or 100% over the lifetime, but at any one point in time, 25% are interested. Health professionals are interested 
but don't have the time. I think there's widespread interest. I have never heard um, opposition from health professionals of any kind. They just don't have the time. So I don't think there's a problem with health professionals. Um, funders, funders have a hard time getting their hands around this field. And why? Because it's not a building. It's not bricks and mortar. It's not a classroom of happy children. It's, um, it's, it's, it tends to be older people. It tends to be people that aren't quite so photogenic. Um, it tends to be secrets that we all carry around with us that we don't like to discuss so much. And so there are some major funders that have been really interested in this space. Uh, probably in this country, the biggest funder has been Robert Wood Johnson. Uh, Atlantic Philanthropies, as I said, was certainly interested in this space. And there's certainly been a number of smaller art shown in California has always been interested in this space. And I'm sure there's a number of others. But it's a little bit harder. It's, um, as far as I know, it's not been a space that has traditionally been funded by Jewish funders. Um, I know that Jewish funders do give a, give some money to chaplaincy services, which is very thankful because chaplaincy services are kind of another piece of this, uh, which we haven't discussed today, which we'd be happy to discuss at some other point because there are Jewish chaplaincy services throughout the country. But I don't think this has been a traditional space for Jewish funders as far as I know, or at least I haven't been aware of it. And I would hope it would become a broader space for them. My response, and I think uh, everything you said is, is true, my response very quickly in just a few seconds, is that I think it's, it's the responsibility, frankly, of funders like Healing Cross Divides and other funders, Robert Wood Johnson obviously being much, much larger, to really try to figure out how health professionals and the broader public as expressed in funders uh, uh, can combine their interests in chronic diseases in terms of cures and realize frankly that health uh, chronic disease self-management broadly defined is absolutely at front and center on this so i want to thank jfn for myself uh, on behalf of healing across the divides for for setting this up uh, we are actually at the close of the hour, and I'll hand it back. I want to thank, of course, Kate, uh, who I've known for years, uh, and applaud all her work. Uh, and now I want to hand this back to my colleagues at JFN. Thank you. Thank you so much again. Um, I'll just say, stay tuned, everyone. We really hope that this will be just the beginning of conversations around this issue. Um, and feel free to follow up with me if you have specific questions or ideas about how you'd like to see us further explore this space. So thanks so much, everyone. Have a great day. Thank you, Norbert and Kate, very, very much. Thank you. Thank you, Judah.